so we started off yesterday around vision and um, talking about today really focusing on implementation and that last pillar or leg, um, if you will, is really about progress monitoring and thinking about how do we really put this together and assess and build towards success in social emotional learning. And so we've worked really hard to pull together what we think are the best um, in the business in this area. And so I'm going to just take a minute to introduce each of them to you. Um, so I'm going to start with Clark McCowan and Clark is the president of Excel Labs. Um, and he is also, also an, an author and his big focus is on building capacity around social emotional learning and is dedicated, um, you know, his career in doing that. So welcome and thank you, Clark. Uh, our next uh, contestant, or I should say panelist today, is Leela Newland, and she's a senior research advisor for Hanover Research, and we are super grateful to have you and a lot of the work that we're doing in our deep dive in SEL um, with our school districts is focusing and getting the support of Hanover Research. Um, but Leela specifically focuses on um, designing, delivering, and evaluating professional de development in this area of social emotional learning to really work to build capacity. So we're excited to have her and hear um, her expertise in that area. Next, we have Dave Ponescu, who is the executive director of PERTS, and PERTS is the project for education research that scales. Um, and at heart and in his profession, he is the senior behavior specialist at Stanford University. And his work really is to translate learning and developmental sciences into scalable tools um, and measures that help support and, um, you know, support student success. So thank you, Dave, for being here today. And last but definitely not least, we have Diana Lay from Panorama. Um, and Diana focuses her work on aligning district priorities um, and deepens that SEL impact um, to best support students. So we are all happy to have um, the four of you with us today. We have a lot to talk about, um, and I'm super excited to just kind of get started. Um, you know, we've I've spent a lot of time kind of speaking with each of them. And I will say, I hope that your community of practice sessions were as impactful and insightful as uh, the one that I participated in just prior to lunch. I will say that um, the group of educators that I had in my group really, I think are really ready for this panel um, as they're really working to kind of put this through together. Um, and I think some key words were coming together around that holistic systemic um, SEL. And so how do we really kind of take that vision, that implementation and that progress monitoring and really kind of put it together? So I'm gonna start a little basic um, and kind of just think in the area around progress monitoring, just to kind of start getting that conversation going. And I know that districts are very interested in three areas of progress monitoring. They're first and foremost looking to track progress on the development of the social emotional learning um, skills in students. Um, they're also looking to track that progress on the changes in school climate and a student sense of belonging. I know that belonging really is a, is a key piece for many, um, as well as tracking the progress and the fidelity of the implementation of the social emotional learning programs that they'd have. So I'd like to start with Clark, um, just to kind of take a minute and explore each of these, or if there's one particular um, emphasis of focus that you'd like to talk with us about today. Thanks, John. Yeah, I, I think all three of the areas that you mentioned are key to supporting practice. And, it, and I think all of us would agree that, um, well, let's face it, nobody likes testing kids. And if you're going to spend the time gathering assessment data, it better be useful. And by us would agree that useful assessment data supports consistent high quality practice that, that, that is um, uh, good for kids. So what do you need uh, in an assessment system to do that? Uh, all three of the things you mentioned, Don, are critical. W what's happening in the classroom? How, what are teachers doing with students? Because if they're not doing things that are conducive to academic, social, and emotional outcomes, it's not fair to expect that you'd see changes in student competence. What are the conditions of learning like that adults are creating? That's really where climate data comes in, student surveys 
asking students how well they, how safe they feel, how much they feel they belong, how much they feel supported as learners, for example. And then finally, using competence data to both bench, if you're talking about progress monitoring, progress from what? Uh, competence assessment data uh, should be used, in my view, to benchmark early in the school year, where are students starting? You know, what are their strengths? What are their needs? How can we use what we learn about students' strengths and needs to guide adult actions, both to create a positive climate and to target those competencies that need the most work, and then reassess after a period of instruction to measure progress. If you have all three of those things in one system, you kind of have the perfect system for scaling evidence-based practices. The Society for Prevention Research had a special issue not too long ago, but the kinds of things you need to scale evidence-based practices in education and other systems and assessment and this kind of assessment is what's needed. So we've actually at Excel Labs been uh, trying to combine competence assessment, climate assessment data and implement, implementation assessment data to provide our partners with just the kind of data they need to know what's going on, what conditions of learning those activities are creating and how students are beginning and ending the school year in terms of their competence levels. Thank you. Diana, would you, what would you add to this? Yeah, I would just echo what Clark described. I think that six kind of summary of the three core things that we'd be thinking about when we're, when we're assessing progress monitoring. The only thing I would add there is also just thinking a lot about developing actionable SMART goals is kind of a starting point we do with a lot of districts. So we think about goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And we know that we use that when supporting students, we use it in classrooms. But from kind of a leadership and implementation perspective, we also want to make sure that we have a direction we're aiming to go. And the SEL assessments, similar to the ones that Clark is describing, really give us kind of the data to develop what that initial SMART goal will be talking towards that consistently over the year. We usually recommend for assessments around SEL and school climate that we're offering those at least two times per year. So you have kind of the formative and then summative. Um, and then we also think through ways that we might be able to do interim check-ins as well for progress monitoring. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I mean, so I, I agree with all that. I, yeah, unsurprisingly, um, those, are, those are great points. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think kind of conceptually, uh, you know, we like to think about data really at its best informing ongoing continuous improvement processes and really informing informing action the most local level where where things need to change, right? So I think um, uh, a lot of the time, uh, you know, efforts are done at a school level, you know, that's great. And then I think it's appropriate for the data to be school level. A lot of the time, I think um, we want changes to happen at a classroom level. So then it's a lot more useful to teachers to get their own data so that, and to get it quickly so they can really, um, so they can, so the data are specific and timely enough. They can actually do different things about it. Um, you know, we, we find that teachers are often really surprised by kind of how their data might differ from those of their colleagues. And it's much more useful to them to say, oh, wow, this is something I need to focus on. Maybe I'm really good at building strong relationships with students, but the work just doesn't feel very meaningful to them. And then once they get that back from, from their own students, it becomes a lot easier for them to kind of just to, to really partner with their students in an authentic way to figure out um, you know, what they can do differently. Um, so I would say, you know, that's one is kind of that specificity and timeliness. I also think it's really helpful um, when, uh, when, when folks get some support to figure out kind of how to make sense of those data. A lot of the time, you know, if they just get those, you know, get those data and they don't really have a, a community or, or other resources to help them make sense of it, it can be really discouraging. Um, and so, you know, it's, I think in an ideal world that, that assessment is really kind of democratized and it really helps people adapt in real time to the, to the conditions on the ground and to make better decisions in an ongoing way about how to better serve their students. Leela. So, of course, I agree with everything that my fellow panelists have said. I think, you know, a few things just to expand on what Dave was just talking about in terms of getting the data in front of teachers. Um, you know, I think about Thomas Gusky's theory of teacher change. They will change if they have the data right in front of them. And generally, you know, Diana was talking about the frequency which you want to be doing assessments and perhaps perhaps interim assessments, the more um, often we can have our teachers looking at student data and reflecting on it, the more likely they are to implement the program that Clark was talking about with fidelity. So 
So I think those pillars are really important. One thing, Don, and I don't want to derail us, but I do think it's helpful to kind of pull back at a more macro level before we talk about how we're supporting our teachers. Oftentimes in the work that we're doing, we're talking to superintendents and cabinet members about how do I prioritize um, SEL. And I love Diana's point about making sure that we're using a Smarty framework. Um, at the same time, when I think about assessment with SEL, some of the other things I think about um, are, have we looked at our policies? It's not just about the programs we adopt and looking at what's happening in the classroom. We as district leaders have to ask ourselves, do we have that mission vision that we were talking about before this session, Don? How does our strategic plan hold our leadership and our classroom teachers accountable? So, so I also would like to maybe open up our understanding of assessment and how we talk about it in this session to also think about some of the qualitative ways. So do we look, you know, a benchmarking study of policies to understand what is it that we have to have at the system level so that we have clearly articulated what it is that we expect it to look like. Because I've been in meetings where we're sitting with a district leadership team and we're talking about school climate data. And as we start really reflecting and digging into what we're seeing, this realization, think about this district in Washington State, where the district leaders were saying, you know, we've had a lot of turnover at the school leadership level, and we haven't really articulated in the past 24 months what it is that we expect around the learning environment. And so when we think about assessment, I also think about other things that we can be looking at across the district to determine readiness and also progress. I think you bring up a really good point, and I will get to you in one second, Clark. Uh, I agree in essence of really kind of taking a step back as I, you know, was listening to the responses and really getting into the nitty gritty because I know that that's a lot of what people want to hear. I, in my own mind, was thinking the why, the why around assessment and how much is too much and what are the purposes for why, for why we are actually doing this. And so, again, I go back to one of our charges um, in the summit, but also in this work around social emotional learning is, you know, what is systemic SEL and what is success in systemic SEL look like? And so I guess I'm going to throw that out. Like what, what is success? What do you th think? What would we visibly be seeing? And I'll throw it to Clark because I know he raised his hand to talk. Thanks, Don. Yeah, and, and this uh, the question is related to some of the thoughts of my colleagues on the panel just stimulated both uh, Dave and Lilo's comments were making me think about the the systemic context of assessment. You know, assessment. I I am an assessment developer, and I love measurement and all that stuff. But it's dawned on me uh, relatively recently in the last few years that the assessment tool itself gets you to the starting line, but it doesn't do any good if it doesn't make sense in, in the most basic sense. Like, do people understand what the scores from the assessment mean? It doesn't do any good if they don't sit down and look at the data. It doesn't do any good if they have no way of taking the data and acting on it in a constructive way. All of those things are, are influenced by, you know, Dave, your comment about the level of aggregation that's in the timeliness, uh, that kind of contextual factor, and uh, by the broader context that Leo is talking about, the both district and statewide policy. How does what's being assessed relate to the expectations that are codified into state standards that say what kids should know and be able to demonstrate at different uh, grade levels, for example? If the standards say, the kids need to uh, know these things and the assessment is measuring these things well then it suddenly loses its power because it's not reinforcing that message from the policy context similarly if a a, a district has adopted a program that has a scope and sequence covering com competencies a b c and d the assessment sure as well better measure a b c and d also so that it can be informative as to how to use that instructional resource and as to whether that instructional resource is having a difference. So, so you know, systemic. I I think of school systems and the school context. It's super. They're super complicated ecologies, and uh, and assessment seems like such a straightforward thing in many ways. Take a test, get a score, but um, you release an assessment into the wild, and there's this incredibly complex ecosystem that wraps around that assessment, and a lot of things have to go right for the assessment to advance practice. Dave? 
Um, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate this, this question. Um, and, you know, so I, I think in, in schools, we tend to focus a lot on, on what we want students to develop at the end of the day. And I think that's really healthy. I think often it's helpful to think about where the, the end point where we want to get. Um, but that journey can be really important too. So, so just let me just walk that out for a second. So uh, the PERTS uh, and I am a, a member of the Building Equitable Learning Environments Network. And there um, we said that, you know, we think an equitable learning environment is one in which every student develops intellectual cu curiosity and strong academic skills, a sense of agency and optimism for the future, self-love, self-acceptance and pride in one's identities, empathy for and meaningful connections with others and, and a number of other things, right? So these are all positive things that we want students to leave school having. Um, and as a network, we think those things are all important, but rather than just measure whether students have those abilities, we as, an, as a network have intentionally committed to, to focus our measurement efforts, not on just on whether students develop those things, rather students have those attributes, but rather whether the environments and conditions in our school systems are actually creating conducive conditions for students to develop those, um, those attributes. So for example, like our typical assessments in schools tend to focus on the downstream results of effective learning, like high test scores or grades, and to focus less on the upstream causes of effective learning, like assignments that are relevant enough, culturally and personally relevant enough to motivate and engage students. And I think that that, that conventional approach to measurement that really just focuses downstream on, on the effects rather than on the causes can be really troubling because when assessments reveal the shortcomings, student shortcomings, without revealing the shortcomings of the systems that are intended to serve them, it becomes a lot easier to treat students as deficient and harder to recognize how we need to change the systems in order to better support um, students' uh, students development. Um, and that's why, you know, that's why we're really, you know, try to be committed to, to measuring not just the students, but to really measuring the system and whether the system is creating a conducive developmental environment. Um, so. Diana? Yeah, I just I was nodding enthusiastically to everything you were saying, Dave, because I completely agree with that. I think we absolutely want to be thinking about the health of our system overall. And when districts are defining success, that really needs to live within kind of that local context. And the areas of strength in your system and kind of your tier one or your universal supports, the ways in which you're equitably supporting students across your community as well as adults. It's going to look different district by district and across each community. And I think being very clear about where your systems are healthy and strong and where they can develop ensures that you're able to reach those equitable outcomes before jumping straight towards providing intervention for students. And to use Dave, your words kind of thinking about students as deficient, we want to instead think about how we build those healthy learning environments. Um, and I, I think the only thing I would add there is again, just making sure that the goal setting and kind of how you define success is based on what you locally learn in your context, whether that's through gathering qualitative feedback or quantitative feedback in the form of SEL assessment or surveys. When we think about, you know, looking at this, you know, this climate and the student sense of belonging or their connection to school, which we've identified as a key piece to this, you know, what kinds of assessments provide a window into students and teachers' perception of this culture and the climate of school? And, you know, what are the variety of options schools and districts have in selecting a way to ensure this progress? Anyone want to start? Feel free to raise your hand because I can see you. <laughs> All right, Clark, uh, uh, you're uh, up again. Okay, Dave, great, Dave. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to start us off. I, I think there's so many amazing uh, resources and tools out there, so it's kind of hard to know where to start. Um, I mean, I think uh, you know, certainly, I think I, I think the best combination is really when there's a, a quantitative and qualitative component. Um, so, for example, in, in our own work. You know, we, we tend to really focus on the classroom, um, and I think there's lots of other other resources that are better for other kinds of contexts. So, like, so just to give a concrete example, I think in our work, we you know we ask you know students give feedback to their teachers about how they're experiencing different learning conditions. Like, does the work seem relevant? Is it culturally affirming? Is the relationship with the teacher positive? Different kinds of things like that, so the teacher can really kind of titrate their you know their 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 decision making and, and their practices. More appropriately, and what we find is that you know those quantitative data are really eye-opening for a lot of teachers. They're often pretty shocking, and they're like, "Oh my goodness, this is that's not at all what I expected." But then I think often the the best the best insights come when then those teachers go ahead and they they debrief with their students, they and they talk with their students, or they they you know they do discussions and things like that. So I think and I think that combination is really powerful because the the quantitative data kind of guide the initial conversation and where you focus those kind of follow-up discussions. 
And then, and then they also allow you to test, okay, well, we, you know, we had this conversation, did it actually lead to, to kind of measurable improvements? But I think a lot of the biggest richness actually happens in between when, when there's a real partnership, um, either with students or, or maybe with teachers or whoever the stakeholders are who are involved in that process. Leela. So um, I agree with Dave and similar what we will do similar work with our members. I would also say um, for those in the audience who are just starting grounding this in the way you would approach any evaluation. So what is your theory of change? And so we've been talking about what are the factors in the system, the district level, the school level, the classroom level. And so oftentimes we find that sitting down with the leadership team and relevant stakeholders, your program directors, and talking about not just why are we doing this, so the context that Clark was talking about, but also what are our expectations? So anytime we're doing an evaluation, we want to understand what is it that we're going to do? What are the anticipated short-term outcomes? What are the long-term outcomes? So that we can also set reasonable expectations, because I also think that as we talk about assessment data and pushing the needle on some of these things, sometimes we want to see things move faster than they actually are going to move right and so before we see the change in the academic outcomes we're probably going to see a change in perceptions of environment for example and so having that conversation at the front end can help set expectations and help you celebrate along the way rather than going into meeting after meeting why aren't we making movement do we need to change programs there's that initiative fatigue that our district leaders often experience and that trickles down to the classroom level. So I would just say absolutely mixed methods, but I would also suggest that you consider putting together some kind of theory of change logic model so that you all have that guiding framework as you're coming back to determine are we making progress? What did we expect to change? Um, and do we need to revisit that? Was that realistic or not? Lilo, what would you, you know, what, what is, thank you for commenting because there is a, a definitely a continuum of folks out there, some who are just starting out, you know, and what is that first actionable step they should be taking in, in developing and creating this? What would you recommend? Well, you know, it comes back to that goal setting that Diana um, and Diana may want to jump in and share some of the work that she's doing. But when you sit down and you look at what are our goals, what is it that we're trying to achieve? And then asking yourself, how are we going to do that? And that's really where you start with your theory of change, right? So what is it that we want to do? How are we going to do it? Because then that comes to which programs are we implementing? What are the expectations for this? I can't tell you the number of times somebody has come to Hanover and said, can you evaluate this program? And we ask, okay, well, what was the intention for implementing it? And there's a little bit of silence because one, maybe it was adopted before this leadership team came in, or it was done in pilot format and it seemed to be working and so we enthusiastically scaled because we're all well intentioned everything we do in our schools every day is about making an impact on our students but oftentimes it can be difficult to create that space to have a conversation around creating a theory of change so i would say come back to your goals what is it that you're trying to do how do you think what's your best guess you know, we're, we're talking we're all researchers in the room here so what's our hypothesis what's the best guess for how we're going to get there and then how are we going to assess how if whether or not we're achieving that diana <laughs> yeah i love i love that i think that's ex that's very much what i would ground recommendations around too sort of what is your theory of change and action and I think what I've observed a lot this past year is, Don, you mentioned kind of sense of belonging is a core value that a lot of our districts are trying to develop. And I think a theory of action can sound as simple as we want all of our students to have a trusting adult relationship on campus, or we want every child to feel a sense of connectedness to their school community. And then building off of that, my theory of change might be, if that is the case, then my students will feel a stronger sense of confidence in achieving academic outcomes when they have an adult they can turn to for support. And when it's kind of simple, simplified in that way, it becomes very easy to say, okay, we're gonna start with a survey and we're gonna ask, do you feel connected on your campus? Do you feel a sense of belonging? And kind of as Dave described, that becomes then sort of the trigger point for all the steps you take after that. But I love the vision of kind of what is your theory of change? What do you believe to be true? 
what do you want your students to feel each day when they engage with adults on their campus? And if we ground ourselves there, I think it simplifies the work a little bit. It can feel very complicated until we say, I just want our kids to feel safe and connected. Dave? Yeah, I, yeah I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm just such, such a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of share this term <laughs> that I sometimes use the, um, uh, the uh, programitis. Um, so, you know, I, I think I think in the ed sector, we often have this, we, I think we have a, a serious case of programitis. Um, so I really like this point of folks implementing programs and not really thinking about well, what are, what goals are those programs supposed to have? And so, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of programs that are really amazing that have great outcomes, but I think it's important not to center the programs and instead to think about what are, you know, th those programs have an impact on students by creating certain kinds of experiences for students. Right, so a program might help teachers develop strong, caring relationships that help students feel safe enough in the, in the learning environment uh, you know, to, to not have to worry about you know, being treated unfairly so they can actually focus on learning and take healthy risks. Right? A program might help uh, teachers make, make or assign really meaningful assignments that are culturally relevant and to get students engaged. Right? So that, that's great. Um, but there's almost always a bad way to implement a program, um, you know, and, and, and so uh, I think it's really important or, or maybe it just needs to, be, needs to be tweaked in some way. So I think they're, they're really they're implementing those programs with, in recognition of, of what they're intended to accomplish and really doing that, that monitoring side by side or, or kind of in real time so you can identify, okay, what seems to be working about this, what's not working about it, not so you can just abandon the program, but maybe you can tweak it a little bit, maybe you can realize, oh, this might be another way, another approach to, to do this kind of thing now that we're really focused not on the program as a monolithic thing, but the underlying uh, impact that, it, that we want it to have. And I'm going to um, have, uh, I know Clark wants to answer, but I'm also going to throw in there as I'm listening to you, I'm also thinking not just student focus, how do we also bring all of this in from the board table to the classroom? And that includes our staff, our teachers, our bus drivers, and, and our parents. And so how do we ensure that we are taking a, a full 360 view of our community and that community includes all? Um, Clark, I'll turn it to you. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, Don, but I'll answer a different one that's slightly related to it, which is that um, I think that if we're gonna have the entire community use data to inform practice, you know, Don, you asked a few minutes ago, what's a good start point for a district that's considering, I think your question is really about SEL in general, but I'm gonna narrow it down to, if you're considering doing any form of SEL assessment, be it student competence, climate, or implementation, um, what do you need to know about yourself before you go down that journey? And one of the things I would really recommend is um, reflect on your current data use practices and community data literacy. Districts vary tremendously in terms of the extent to which they use any kind of assessment data, reading, math, whatever. To the extent they may administer tests, never look at the scores. All the way to they have really high functioning data teams, grade level teams that review data regularly and wisely interpret and use that data to guide practice. Depending on where you are on that continuum with your data literacy and data teams, that'll really inform how ready you are to integrate SEL assessment data into your current practice. And if you're more at the beginning end of the continuum, then establishing a culture of data and uh, increasing data literacy will be an important part of your initiative. If you're already a high performing data use uh, school or district, then it becomes easier to integrate and assimilate SEL assessment data alongside of other assessment data uh, to inform decision making. And in a sense, that's, that's about the entire community as well. Uh, some districts, it's only the folks at the very top who ever look at the data, nobody else does. So in my view, uh, to the extent that data are transparent and used by all constituents, it has the greatest potential to have a positive impact. So this is really about lifting all boats amongst the adults to teach them how to interpret and use data wisely to guide practice. So let's dive deeper into that triangulation of data and uh, effective best practices around that. Um, who would like to start, Dave? Uh, sure. Um, so, you know, so I, I think uh, in our work, um, you know, we, we know that, that certain classroom conditions help students engage and learn, like, you know, when work is meaningful, when they have positive relationships, when they have a sense of growth, 
Um, but in the same way, if we want teachers to deeply learn and effectively adopt new SEL practices, it's also important to create the, the right kind of professional conditions, um, kind of professional learning conditions for them. Um, so I, I think you know one of the, one of the things, of course, is to give them you know recommendations um, for what to do you know what to do differently to give them evidence based, concrete recommendations that actually are developmentally appropriate given where they are and and where their students are. Um, I think that's one thing that, that we tend to do. I think relatively well compared to some of the other things. I think I think there's a really important role in assessment there, um, which is to to make sure that as when we're giving folks you know things to try that they're also getting the formative ongoing feedback to see. Okay, well, is it working, right? And, and not to use it to evaluate them, because I think a lot of teachers are, are worried about data being used to evaluate them. So they're kind of data phobic. And that actually makes them makes them makes it harder for them to engage meaningfully um, with the data. So I think it's really important um, to, to give to give teachers those that data back or to give educators that data back, but in a way that really helps them learn and use it for learning rather than worrying about it being used for evaluation. Um, and then I think last, but by no means least, I think that in order for that to happen, um, those recommendations and those assessment data are really served best <laughs> on a dish of a warm, supportive community of practice. Um, uh, I, I think you know it's you know we've seen the biggest gains in student experience when uh, when teachers are are you know are getting recommendations and they're getting their data back, but they're but they're getting to process those data as a part of a community. Um, that allows that gives them time and space to be reflective about their practice, to really make sense of the data together, to see it, you know, to see maybe one of their colleagues down the hallway is is doing something really different and having very different outcomes to their students. And a lot of the time, we're so siloed, the teachers never have the opportunity to learn that. And so, I think some of the in in our own work, I think some of the things that I found most exciting were to hear the stories about teachers learning from someone they've learned they've been in the same hallway with for for years, but they just never realize. Um, that, that this person was amazing at making work feel relevant or amazing at building those relationships. And when you put teachers into a, into a, into an authentic, supportive community or practice where they have those data and they have some resources, um, then really amazing things can happen when they, when they really start learning from each other. Yeah, I think you're right. Those systems are extremely important um, to make sure you have into place, um, especially in that community of practice. Um, Clark. And maybe Clark is frozen. Leela. Great. When Clark comes back, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, so completely agree with Dave. I think, you know, oftentimes in the work that we do, we find we have professional learning communities set up, but how do we actually function within the PLC? So you know, we create tools and resources, discussion guides, toolkits, templates for making that bridge because the other piece you know i think everybody in the room right now works with school districts directly we can help analyze the data and provide recommendations but at the same time i'm a former classroom teacher there's only so much that i'll take from somebody outside the district telling me about my kids and what i should do right and so how do we create the the tools and resources um i like to use the word discovery when we're talking about sel or equity and we've been circling around equity i know we're going to get to that later in the discussion but how do you discuss facilitate discoveries along the journey so rather than telling recommending suggesting it's we're going to facilitate your discovery and me making meaning and we're here to help along the, the way the other thing because i know you had asked us all a question and, and you know we're kind of meandering around it but what does it look like for staff as well in terms of creating the environment and measuring and i think it's really important in this session that we talk about how our students cannot be well and feel safe and secure if our teachers don't feel well and that's that when you know dave talked about his work um, around equity and and the network that he's in you know there's this intersection that i think came into laser focus for all of us that perhaps we weren't talking about pre-COVID, that during COVID, we all were confronted with how SEL and equity directly intersect. And so when we think about our staff, we also have to think about if I as a teacher or I as support staff don't feel included and that there's equity in my environment, how can we possibly expect that we're going to create that in our learning environment so you know dave and clark and diana have all talked about looking at the system as well but i think when we talk about our staff um we we do have to think about what are the measures we're using 
to assess their feelings of their working conditions and their experiences. So then if, if we find that we have issues there, we have to make sure that there's work that's happening at the same time where we're focused on our working environment and our learning environment. And Clark's back. <laughs> Clark, I'll let you jump in, but I want to get back to that equity piece. So I know you were um, itching to speak um, on that last topic. Do you want to jump back in or you got? Sure, and let me apologize. I, uh, my internet chose the exact wrong moment to be spotty. So I'm on my telephone right now. And uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, well, it could be worse, I guess. Uh, thank God for 5G. Let's just say that. <laughs> So um, I guess we're talking about equity. That's uh, what I'm picking up on. Let me just touch base on one thought I had before and then talk a little bit uh, about uh, some thoughts about equity. Um, I, you know, Don, you'd asked about sort of best practices around uh, data. And um, one thing that really left to mind that I think is underappreciated consideration around uh, assessment and data use is being intentional about how the data are going to be used. And what I mean by that is you're going to assess kids, what decisions are you going to make with the assessment data? It's a very different thing to what you're going to teach than it is to decide whether a child has a diagnosis of some sort or another, right? There's a very, very different kinds of questions. The assessment doesn't care what you do with it. But you as educators have to be intentional about what decisions will you make and will you not make with the data. And if those if those are articulated and repeated by your leadership and um, institutionalized in data teams, it uh, maximizes the chance that data will actually do what it's supposed to do and not do what it's not supposed to do. Okay, it sounds like a kind of trivial consideration, but nobody pays attention to it. How are you going to use data? What decisions are you going to make? What decisions are you not going to make? In some ways, you know, if I think about the issue of equity, it's not unrelated to that, that issue. Because, you know, if you say, I'm going to be focusing on uh, adult actions with my assessment data, rather than its child characteristics or deficits, then uh, this, even with the very same assessment, if you have the, the first intention, uh, focusing on adult actions rather than child characteristics, then you're likely to be producing the conditions that adults can create that are going to be good for all kids. So intended uses of assessments have an equity implication that I think it's a hypothesis, but I think it's probably right. And it's an underappreciated consideration in how assessment data are used both to support teaching and learning and to support equity. And I'll stop there. Diana? Um, I was just kind of reflecting on a few of the comments, but I know, Don, that you were going to ask us another connected to equity, if you wanna sure. prompt. Sure, you can dive right into the equity question, that's great. I love you guys are all so energetic about all these, <laughs> it's like all these passionate people. Um, <laughs> let's go right in, they're all listening uh, intently and anything you <laughs> Yeah, no, I've just been reflecting a lot on the comments around kind of equitable systems. And I think what we're thinking about a lot right now is when we think about equity in SEL, SEL is a vehicle to ensuring that we have equitable environments on campus where all students feel and can access resources. And I love the kind of connection back to modeling this among adults and thinking about adult development and skill development to be able to engage students in kind of every type of learning environment. I'm also thinking a lot about that comment on kind of student voice and data being part of the broader ways that we're supporting students, whether that's looking at academics, behavior attendance, making sure that SEL assessment data that we're kind of discussing today is no longer siloed but is built into the decision-making process for how we're ensuring that every child has access to the right resources at the right time. So at Panorama, we do a lot of things like student data voice protocols to sort of systematize um, and strengthen the use of student voice, whether that's by inviting students into conversation with teachers in one-on-one -on -one settings, or if that's like, 
bringing the responses of a student survey into an SST meeting at the same time that you're designing an intervention that's responsive to math assessment data. We have the students self efficacy responses and growth mindset responses as kind of a pillar for how we're differentiating our services, making sure that we're meeting every child where they're at and that their voice is kind of centered in that decision as well. So when you think about equity and, um, you know, obviously SEL is, you know, uh, the cornerstone of around equity and in terms of, of assessment, what, what does that mean for you? What, what are those key things? I know a lot, a lot of conversations that we've had today have been separate, like here's what I'm doing for SEL and here's what I'm doing for equity. And I have this equity plan. And obviously we really want to be able to make sure that we're bringing all of this together and it's meaningful. Um, and so what does that look like um, in some of the things that you do in your work, Diana? Um, do you mean kind of how we're differentiating type? Yeah, what does, what does equity and assessment mean to you? Simple. Yeah, um, I think it means when when we're gathering formative feedback from students and we call that an assessment, maybe we call it a survey, we're not only asking students on their own skills and mindsets, which is an important guidepost for uh, apologies if my internet's going in and out, an important guidepost for kind of thinking about their development and their life readiness. But we're also making sure that we're asking them about the environments that we as adults are sort of creating alongside them so that we know if they're able to access the resources that we have available to them. And that kind of that assessment is sort of how we're creating different um, support plans for every child. Dave. Um, I was laughing before you, when you said, oh, it's simple, <laughs> a simple question. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a good one. Um, so uh, I was just going to say, well, so just kind of re reiterate from before, I mean, I think one part is, is to make sure that we're measuring not just, you know, things that are, the things in students, but also the, the, that environment, the environmental conditions. I think that's one important piece. I think a second important thing piece is to disaggregate the data, that's SEL data, as well as academic data. In order to identify the, the least well served groups in our system, the, the, the groups that our systems are serving least well. And then I think there's a third part here that I think is really important and that I think sometimes gets missed is that that often I think that schools or 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 or, or, or editors or anyone really will jump really quickly to solutions without consulting the members of those groups. So I think it's really important once you've identified a least well served group of students or least well groups of students to involve them and to really share power in that process. I mean, you know, I think it's really important to, to meaningfully include members of those groups, in the process of improving the systems um, that, are, that are currently failing them. Um, and so, you know, I would just encourage everyone to do everything you can to understand the experiences of those folks and to give them real voice, real agency, and real choice in the kind of transformation, uh, education transformation that you're hoping will ultimately help them. Ila, I know that this was a big topic um, for you that you really wanted to kind of talk a little bit more. Do you want to expand a little bit more on that equity piece? Sure. You know, there are a few things that stand out to me that I think um, might be of interest. One, I love what Dave and Diana just shared. I think, you know, we often frame it when we're talking about our equity audit work, um, the what. So that's where we're looking at assessment data. We're just trying to understand what is at play. And then it's the root cause analysis, right? So why is this happening what's at play because you know i like to give the example of we have pro issues of programmatic access we change, pivot to open enrollment guess what we work with a lot of districts who have open enrollment policies and still have issues um, of equity with programmatic access so so it's i think it's really important to emphasize dave's point about not jumping to acting even though there's urgency i i don't think we're none of us are suggesting there is an urgency to this but it is important to pause and make sure you understand that why um you know the other thing that comes to mind when i think about these assessments that we've been talking about this afternoon um is some of the work that we did last year and some surprising findings um and and you know clark was talking about data literacy and your readiness and where you are and i think part of that data literacy and that readiness is your readiness to respond to what you see in the data. So I'll give a specific example. 
we were doing a climate survey in school district here in Virginia. And when we, this was a school district that we've been doing this year over year, but in the midst of COVID and remote instruction, we actually found that some of the black and brown students in the school district felt a greater sense of belonging and had a more positive experience in their learning environment while remote than in person. And I just pause for a second because that was a lot to process for the district and school leadership teams as we were going through this data. And then what are the implications as we prepare for reopening and, and the return to normal and what is the new normal? And so, you know, I, I think just to kind of bring together a few of the ideas that we've talked about, part of data literacy is also what are we ready to act on? Are we prepared to face what it is that we reveal as we're disaggregating our data? Um, and, and having those conversations um, are really important, one, because it's going to make sure that you're ready to act, but also the reality that our district leaders are working in, in terms of community context and blowback that we've seen in communities when we go out with data and start talking about data, and we haven't laid the foundation to have these conversations. So that's just what I would add um, to, to this portion of the panel. Um, I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper to that and, and bringing up kind of COVID and, you know, obviously a lot of folks who are listening in right now are already doing some type of assessment. What are those factors um, that may be impacting student skill development given um, what's happening with COVID and some learning loss and not being in school? What should they be thinking about? Um, and how do we control or adjust? Uh, I like what you're saying, like we shouldn't really be acting, but is there are there other considerations um, that we should be you know, thinking about as we're looking at some of the data that we'll be seeing um, come the fall? Uh, I'll jump in and just say really quickly, um, my view of that is, uh, let's take the measure of things in the fall. You know, let's find out where students are starting uh, so we can make decisions about educational practice based on uh, students' zone of proximal development, whether it's in reading, math, social emotional development, uh, and or the conditions of learning themselves. And that's one of the, I think, real values of assessment. We often talk about you know, measuring at the end of the year summatively. But I know, Diana, you mentioned a sort of formative assessment early in the year, and I'm a big believer in that too. Let's use our assessments to, to benchmark things. And there's gonna be no time that's maybe more important to do that than this coming fall, given that this last year was one of the crazier ones on record. Where are students starting? It's anybody's guess. Let's get some data to figure that out. Anyone like to add to that? Dave? I mean, just, just uh, I mean, I, I think that I think schools are such complex environments that adaptation is always important. And I think that's why it's so helpful to be getting ongoing data and really not just to be getting the data, but to actually have systems and teams in place that can come together, review those data and make sense of it. So I think that the data are important, but so too are the are the kind of the, the actual structures and protocols for coming together to review those data and make sense of it. I love uh, Layla's uh, phrase. That, that, that you all um, try to facilitate discovery. Um, that, that's that's like a one. I'm gonna. I might might have to steal that from you. Um, and I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. But I think that you know at its best, uh, you know, assessment systems, especially on continuous assessment systems, can can really facilitate that discovery process and help schools adapt in real time. And I think this this upcoming fall will be one of the will be an unparalleled time of, of adaptation. So I think that you know having that those systems in place. Um, and really being nimble, really trying to be nimble and, and, and attuned to what people are, what students and families and staff are experiencing and, and really trying to engage them um, is going to be really important. Leila. Can I just share one other thing that occurred to me as Dave was talking that I think might be um, important for some in the audience. Um, one of the things that we've come across across the past six to eight months is also some hesitation, and I would go so far as to say fear to start talking about equity and using assessment because this was, to your point, the hardest year that our educators have experienced in their careers and the hardest year that our students have experienced. And so this fear that what if we see things that make it look ugly in the district and how are we going to have that conversation? And you know, I'm going to give some unsolicited advice, but when we're talking to district leaders that we're working with, one of the things that I'll say is, well, you can also point out that there's nowhere to go but up. 
So don't shy away from assessment. I think it's really important what Clark and Diana and Dave have said about getting into the school year. Let's administer some assessments early on to understand where we are and don't shy away from that because you're afraid of what you're going to see um because you know did covid have this influence and were we better it's okay this is where we are right now though and we have to deal in reality it's not about who we were pre-covid it's a matter of where are we right now um so that's just something that i wanted to point out because i've heard it so many times in conversations that i think it's important to note in this session as well um, thank you. I'm going to turn it to you, Diana, and you can either expound upon that and I'd like for you to think about um, when we talk about subgroups, what are some things that um, our educators who are listening in really need to be thinking about when using assessments and how those subgroups can impact um, and how do they know, um, you know, if it's something that's, uh, you know, program related or um, what in, in, in dealing with some of those um, SEL assessments? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So first kind of reflecting on Layla, your last point, um, I'm thinking a little bit about one of the big questions that I hear a lot when we're kind of thinking, well, how do we do formative assessment? And then and then how will we disaggregate that by subgroup is what are we what should we be asking at this point in the year? And I think there's a really interesting opportunity for districts to get kind of like a fresh view of student perceptions post COVID, where we might be able to ask, for example, um, how are you feeling about teacher student relationships right now? And we're asking that of both teachers, of family members, as well as of students. And I think to Layla's point, we may be surprised at what we see in the data, we have to kind of open ourselves up to that discovery process. Um, one of the things that we've observed with the districts I'm working with in California is actually a lot of kind of what we call it growth and student perception data around teacher student relationships. And we are, it's kind of an opportunity for celebration because we can think about all the innovative ways that our educators have tried to remain connected to students in these sort of unprecedented learning environments. And we're actually seeing that students are responding really positively to that intentional relationship building. And maybe that happened over Zoom, maybe it happened in like, breakout rooms and things like that, but students were feeling, with the districts I'm working with in California, we're feeling that connection. When we think about subgroups, I also then think, how do we carry that into understanding, are our systems equitably providing that same level of support for all of our students? So in California, you know, we have a lot of support systems around our English language learners. And so we might examine, are our English language learners also feeling a strong sense of teacher-student relationship and connectedness? If not, are there adjustments that we can make in that department, in our professional development of our ELL educators to really kind of deepen those relationships? Or is there something that's happening really well in that community of students and among those teachers that we actually want to scale across other subgroups? Anyone else want to comment on this, the uh, subgroup piece? I was, just, I was just going to say how I, um, I really like, I appreciate that Diana's point around the, you know, we, we, we talk about that as bright spots, right, of identifying places where, where something really good is happening and then trying to really learn from that. I mean, I, so I just think that that's, that's such a powerful tool for, for schools. I mean, so often there's great, there's pockets of really amazing stuff happening and just creating opportunities for people to recognize that. To be, well, one, to be recognized for doing great things and two, to be, to be elevated and given an opportunity for others to learn from them. I think when, when that's done well, I think it's so, it can be so powerful in part because those solutions are local, right? There's more, there's more trust. You know that, that it's the same students where, where this is working with. So it can just be like a really, really powerful way of, of going, um, going beyond just kind of cookie cutter, you know, programitis type solutions to really localizing, uh, localizing the, the approach to, to, to improvement. So we have five minutes left. I have one last question before we get to go into some small groups. Um, and two, two words come to mind at this point for me. It's around fidelity of implementation and scaling. Um, and, and really kind of then looking at, you know, how are you, how are you ensuring that you are continuously improving, you know, and knowing that you are, you know, moving forward in your, in your journey with social emotional learning. And so what do you suggest 
as strategies that enable a school or district to assess if a program is being implemented well, which is then going to lead to greater scale across your organization. So with that, um, who would like to start? And I'm gonna give, let everyone speak to this one. I'll jump in real quick as, uh, as I want to do and say that um, implementation measurement is really hard if you want to do it psychometrically rigorously, you know, observing teachers teaching a lesson and getting reliable on the observation instrument, all that stuff takes time and money and is often, uh, if you can do it, fantastic. That's the, that's the best case scenario. Um, I kind of have a hypothesis though, that a better way to A, know whether implementation is happening and B, at the same time, facilitate greater quality and quantity of implementation is uh, to bind uh, educators together in communities of practice around SEL so that what they're doing is regularly talking in a facilitated context about how they're doing SEL, whether it's a, a program, a curriculum, a set of strategies, whatever. What are you doing? What are you not doing? How often are you doing it? What struggles are you facing? because educators are the best resource for one another and listening in on that conversation is the best way to get a handle on how it's going. Is it psychometrically rigorous? Probably not, but if I had to bet, I'd say that, uh, that being systematic and high quality about communities of practice and SEL within the school is the, the single thing that could be done that would be most likely to yield um, high rates of high quality adoption. Diana. I think just building upon that, um, I really appreciate those comments about kind of supporting the adoption of different strategies in contexts like uh, professional learning communities, things like that. I also think sort of equipping teams with, I know Layla mentioned things like templates, like something that's very, very specific that can be adopted and rolled out within those professional learning communities can help to ensure that there's fidelity of implementation, whether that's in how you're um, doing your data inquiry processes, how you're looking at data alongside I, SEL assessment data, I should say, alongside academics, behavior attendance, your data is not siloed, really equipping teams with kind of the guideposts for how to adopt practices and then implement them with fidelity is key. Thank you. I agree. And I'm going to actually um, have Dave speak, but when uh, it's making me think I do want to make sure that when Leela answers, she thinks about uh, professional development, because what you're saying, I think, is a, is a key component to that. OK, Dave, you're up. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that um, uh, I, I think it could be while it can be really hard to, to to come up with new measures that are specific to the implementation of a given program, I think there's actually a lot of commonality in the kinds of, of mediating factors, the kinds of conditions that the programs are intended to impact. So for, for example, you know, good SEL programs probably are going to have some kind of impact on student psychological safety, on their sense, uh, on their sense of the content is meaningful or personally relevant, on their personal agency, on, on the caring relationships. And so even if without having like specific fidelity measures for a given program, I think usually those programs are intended to shift that experience of the classroom. And so by by measuring the experience of the classroom, I think we can get a we can get an inkling as to is the program having the intended impact as it's being implemented and then so we can kind of uh you know facility discovery about where that might be happening and where where, where maybe it needs to be adapted or abandoned leela so i i'm going to come back to what i said earlier and embedded in this is professional development i promised on but it's the theory of change so it's what is it that we're trying to do and how are we going to get there and within that we have to make sure that we're focused on professional development. So if we have a clear articulation and we're thinking about the support systems we need in place, that, and I, the communities of practice, I completely agree with Clark, and, and that's a form of professional development. More often than not in the program evaluation work that we do, one of our findings as we look at implementation is failure at the rollout phase, that there wasn't enough professional development, it wasn't clear, there wasn't enough follow-up PD, one and done, here's the program, here are the resources, go off and running. And so just that thoughtful planning at the front end, if we don't take the space to say, what are they already doing? So what Dave pointed out, I would take it a step further beyond just celebrating what's happening. 
there's your PD. Now you can leverage people within your district to provide professional development to their colleagues rather than having to hire folks from the outside. So, so you know, it, it's it, that local context matters. So when you're really thinking about implementing, think about where you are, figure that out. Why are we doing this? And then building those supports, which, which absolutely should include COPs. Excellent. Well, this has been exceptional. You are all um, just amazing at your work and your insight and we very much appreciate it and we have an opportunity now i believe it's been put in the chat box for everyone to get to spend a little bit more time with um you know one person so you get to choose one you can choose a room um and go and spend um i think it's a half an hour um of time um with with one of them so please go ahead thank you again i I've learned so much. I know that um, our audience is so grateful for the insights that you've been able to provide. So as a whole group, I just want to say thank you um, and thank you for all the support that you've given to to the field.